Welcome everyone. We are live with another episode of Level Up Law. Every Tuesday at noon, South Carolina Legal Services is leveling up your legal knowledge about an area of law that we practice in. And we are delighted to bring you today's episode on Social Security Survivor Retirement. I'm Susan Engel, Senior Staff Attorney and host of Level Up Law. And as always, our producer Kenneth Elliott from our IT department is here with us, making sure everything's running properly. And you are viewing our public benefits unit head here at South Carolina Legal Services, Jenny Kaufman, who is from our office in Conway, South Carolina. Am I right about that, Jenny? You're in Conway, right? Oh, yes, I'm in Conway, but I handle the whole coastline, okay. South awesome. Carolina coastline. Well, that's great. And Jenny's going to discuss what benefits your family is entitled to receive um, as Social Security survivor benefits. But before that, we always do want to remind you that this is not legal advice, just general information for the public, but it is important information um, that we want people uh, to get out there. If you need the help of a lawyer, you can call our intake line here at Legal Services or apply online, and all that information will be provided at the conclusion of today's presentation. Also, as a reminder, all of our episodes are posted by our producer, Kenneth Elliott, on our Level Up Law playlist on our YouTube channel. So you can watch for a, a repeat of that anytime uh, you want to. Um, it's usually out there within 24 hours. And hopefully some of you are watching on the replay uh, when you're hearing this for the first time. Um, also for today, Jenny can answer um, general questions if there is time at the conclusion of her presentation. So just put any questions that you have in the question box on your screen. So Jenny, let's get started. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, it's the day after Memorial Day. Uh, shout out to um, veteran families uh, that are, you know, still with us. Um, your loved ones gave up a lot for our freedoms and I certainly do hold a lot of respect for service members, especially those who died um, defending our country. Um, with that, we're going to move over to Social Security, uh, the retirement benefits and survivor benefits so that you can have a better understanding of what you may be entitled to receive for your family members. I hope that the key takeaways that you'll get out of this presentation are that your family members may qualify for benefits. That includes your spouse, current and former, children, minors and adults who are disabled. You have to remember that some of the decisions that you make when you decide it's time to retire will also permanently impact your spouse and other dependents. This is not financial advice. You should contact a certified financial financial planner for personal advice on what is best for you and your family. And as I spent the weekend with um, some of my family members, I reminded them that, you know, Social Security is only one part of your retirement plan. Your savings and pensions or 401ks are supposed to also make up your retirement plan um, going, you know, you should have done that prior to retirement, but you need to remember that Social Security was never meant to be the sole income for retirees. This information is important to all of us because approximately 65 million people receive Social Security benefits. The population of the US is approximately 300 and, 
31.9 million. I left out the millions, I apologize. Um, the p individuals who receive these benefits could be retired, disabled, dependents of retired or disabled workers, and survivors. The vast majority of Title II beneficiaries are retired workers. And Title, I'll go over what it, Title II is um, in a minute. The terms used by Social Security include Title II, which is um, part of the Social Security Act, the original uh, Social Security Act enact, enacted um, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1940s. Its formal name is Retirement, Old Age, Survivors, and Disability Insurance Benefits. The wage record is your lifetime earnings. They can, Social Security can provide that to you uh, on a yearly or by decades. I would advise you to get a a printout that includes your yearly earnings so that you can check it to make sure that there aren't some errors. You never know when an employer may have taken out payroll taxes but not reported it to the IRS or um, to Social Security. Auxiliary benefits is the term that Social Security uses for benefits paid to someone other than the worker. Family maximum is the benefits that are paid to dependents and survivors, and it cannot exceed a monthly limit that Social Security has a formula that if you uh, if you really want to try to figure it out, they have information online that can explain how it's calculated. I don't, I just look it up on my own wage record. It is based on the worker's earnings. Um, the family maximum does not reduce the retiree's personal benefits. Full retirement age, they sometimes also call it the normal retirement age, is the age at which a retiree is first entitled to receive unreduced benefits. It is not early retirement and it's not delayed retirement. For most of us, that age now is gonna be somewhere between 66 and 67. Anybody born after 1960 is going to their retirement Full retirement age is 67. The primary insurance amount is the amount that the worker is eligible to receive at his or her full retirement age, and it is based on their wage record. And most importantly, they look at the highest 10 years of earnings over a 35 year period. We are not discussing supplemental security income today, but you need to be aware of it because if you receive a relatively small amount of Title II benefits, SSI is there to supplement it if you do not have more than $2,000 in resources and if your income is below the federal benefit rate. It is called all Title 16 because it is Title 16 of the Social Security Act. There are no survivor or dependent benefits paid for individuals who are only re, uh, entitled to SSI. I see a lot of misinformation out there out in the um, public sector that says that you can get um, a dependence benefit if you're on SSI. That is not true. It is only paid to the individual. Spouse eligibility is very important. Uh, you need to be married for at least tw 12 months. You have to be age 62 or older. 
um, or caring for a child who is under age 16 or disabled. Divorced spouses, you have to have been legally married for 10 years. There's no requirement that you actually have to have been living together for those 10 years. People sometimes forget that or don't apply for divorced spouses benefits because they've been separated for 20 years and they think they're not entitled to benefits under an, uh, an ex-spouse's uh, wage record. And that is not true. I should also, um, I'll, I'll talk about it later. There are some exceptions for the married for at least 12 months rule. And there is now equal treatment of marriage between same gender or opposite gender spouses. Common law marriage. South, um, Social Security looks at the laws of the state where the worker is legal living when the application for spousal benefits is filed. Um, so it will, common law marriage differs from state to state. It is mostly um, out of favor in most of the US, South Carolina abolished common law marriage effective July 24th, 2019. But if you believe you had a common law marriage prior to that date, you just, you, you're gonna have to prove it um, and prove that the marriage existed prior to July 24th, 2019. 19. It is not easy to prove a common law marriage. Um, Social Security requires a lot and, and you, you should contact a family law attorney, including the great family law attorneys with South Carolina Legal Services to find out what you would need in South Carolina to prove a common law marriage. Um, in general, though, the relation Social Security looks to whether or not you would inherit under state law. The benefit amount um, paid to a um, family member is approximately 50% of the benefit that is paid to the retired worker. There are variations on that that I'll go over, but for individual for spouses that um, are currently married or divorced from a worker who is still alive, it is approximately 50% of that benefit. Um, you cannot receive those benefits under your the retired worker's wage record unless the worker has begun receiving retirement benefits from Social Security. Um, it's slightly different for divorced spouses um, the worker does not have to actually be receiving benefits. There used to be a way that a retired worker could apply for, or, or a wage earner could apply for retirement benefits under their own record, obtain benefits for their non-working spouse, and then suspend their own um, benefits, allowing the spouse to begin receiving benefits, but that rule has been abolished. So there is no longer a file and suspend um, rule that will allow you to start collecting benefits for your spouse earlier than when you start receiving. So an example, this is just an easy one. Joe, 62, is married to Maria, 66. Joe will be eligible to receive $700 a month on his wage record if he waits until his 
um, full retirement age, and Maria is already receiving $1,600 a month. What would Joe be able to receive at his full retirement age? Well, he would get approximately $800 a month, $700 on his own wage. Whoops, there's a typo, I'm sorry. $700 a month on his own wage record plus $100 a month from um, his spousal's, spouse's um, wage record. That will add up to half of her 1600. Um, her benefits don't change. If Joe was to apply for retirement benefits now, he is only going to get $490 a month on his own wage record, assuming he applies um, to start benefits the month he turns 62. Plus, he would then get $310 a month in spousal benefits. So for him, there's probably no harm in applying for early retirement benefits because he's going to get $800 a month regardless of whether or not he waits until he's um, 67 or he starts receiving it at age 62. In order for children to receive um, benefits on a retired parent's record, they have to be an eligible dependent, meaning they are an unmarried adult under age 18 or age 19 and still in high school, or they're an unmarried adult disabled child. They have to prove that they were disabled prior to age 22. If their disability started later than in life, they are not eligible for benefits on a parent's record. Their benefit amount is also approximately 50% of the wage earner's primary insurance amount subject to the family maximum. Um, equal shares are divided amongst all eligible children. And this is while the wage work, wait, ugh, can't say that. While the wage worker is still alive, it goes up to 70% of the wage worker's primary insurance um, amount when that person, when their, the parent dies. It is, a, it is a program that is really beneficial for individuals who have been disabled since um, they were young. Otherwise, they would probably only be eligible for SSI. Um, and I know it has enhanced the life of many an adult disabled child. Grandchildren. In order for your grandchild to be eligible for benefits on your record, they have to be legally adopted or the grandparent is going to have to prove that both parents are deceased or disabled, and the grandchild or grandchildren live with, grand, with the grandparent and receive at least half of their support from the grandparent for an entire year. I initially thought it was a lot harder to, to get benefits for grandchildren but if you can prove that you are providing at least half of the support for your grandchild, you should go ahead and apply for benefits from them. You don't necessarily have to go through the adoption process. We have more and more grandparents who are raising their grandchildren and a lot of them want to go through the adoption process, which can be expensive, 
so that they um, can get benefits for their grandchild. You should check, however, to make sure that the benefit is going to be higher under the grandparent's wage record as compared to their deceased or disabled parents. Childhood disability benefits. Um, this is disabled adult children. Uh, the name changes so often, it's really hard for me to keep up with what Social Security is calling it under any given time period, but it's CDB, Childhood Disability Benefits. We commonly refer to it as Disabled Adult Child Benefits because it is a clear title because it reflects that these are adults. The child must be over age 18, must have a disabling condition or impairment that started prior to age 18. It has to meet the adult disability standards. Importantly, the individual must be unmarried unless they are married to another person who is disabled. I have had clients who were receiving disabled adult child benefits of, you know, $1,500 to $2,000 because they had high wage earner parents and then they want to get married because they want to be with somebody, they want the same things that all of the rest of us want, but it takes away that benefit. Um, the other thing that is important to know is the adult child cannot have had substantial earnings after age 22. In other words, they can't have any earned income that exceeds substantial gainful activity, which at levels which Social Security sets yearly in 2023, that is $1,470 a month um, for a non-blind individual and $2,640 a month for a blind person. Um, it is important that disabled adult children who return to work pay attention to their earnings, not only for reasons we have discussed in previous um, presentations. Uh, they can lose their disability benefits because of work activity, um, but also because they really can lose a substantial benefit from their parents' wage record. Um, one of the, the most important things about disabled adult child benefits is that you can retain eligibility for Medicaid even if your income would normally disqualify you for Medicaid. Um, it's a provision in the law that presumes that the individual is eligible for SSI um, as long as they only lost their SSI because of the benefits they're receiving on a parent's wage record. Um, they also will be eligible for Medicare. So, again, important health insurance benefits. Survivors, widows, widowers, surviving divorced spouse, minor children or grandchildren, disabled adult children, and one that a lot of us don't know about or don't think about, and that's the dependent parent of or parents of a wage earner. 
For spousal benefits, uh, survivor's benefits, there are a couple of different age points. One is you can receive early retirement um, as a survivor at age 60, but it will be a reduced benefit. Um, there is no enhanced benefit for survivors to wait until age 70. An enhanced benefit happens when you continue to work after age 70. I mean, after your full retirement age of 66 or 67. Right now, um, the cutoff for enhanced um, retirement benefits is age 70. Along with it increasing the retirement age, they are talking about increasing the um, enhanced benefit age. Um, I'll go over that towards the end of the uh, lecture or the presentation. But in general, if you wait until age 70 to apply for retirement benefits, you will get about 30% more in benefits as the retiree, but that does not spill over to the spouse. The spouse would only be entitled um, to the primary insurance insured amount. Uh, you can apply for disabled widows, widowers benefits as either a spouse or a divorced spouse. And that is for individuals over the age of between 50 and 60, and they have a, dis a disability that started before or within seven years of the worker's death. The, in order to receive these benefits, you have to have been married for nine months prior to death, with the exception for accidental death or death in the line of duty. And again, divorced spouses have to have been married for at least 10 years. The benefit amount, um, if you apply at full retirement age, and again, you do not get an enhanced benefit, so there's no reason to wait after your full retirement age, but it would be 100% of the deceased worker's benefit. For early retirement, age 60, it's going to be reduced by 71.5 to 99%, depending upon what age you take um, early retirement. For a disabled widow or widower, you're going to get 71.5% of the primary insurance amount. And this is where what you do as the retiree has an impact on your dependents and spouses benefits going forward. If your spouse took early retirement and has a reduction of benefits, that is a permanent reduction that if you then also take early retirement, you're going to get a reduction of the reduced amount. I hope that makes sense. So if your spouse was receiving $1,000 a month instead of the 1500 they would have been entitled to at the full retirement age. Um, your benefit is going to be reduced by about 28.5% if you take retirement at age 60. Um, it goes, the, the reduction goes down as you get closer to your full retirement age. And you may have to do that because of your finances. You also need to remember, and I didn't put a slide out there, 
if you take early retirement, you're the you're going to be subjected to um, an earnings limit, so that if you're re working, you can't exceed whatever the earnings limit is for early retirees. After your full retirement age, you can earn as much as you can, and it won't reduce your monthly benefit. Mothers and fathers, this is a little bit misleading, but that's what Social Security calls it. Um, it is the mother or father of a deceased worker's Of the, it is the mother or father of the children of a deceased worker. It is not the deceased worker's parents. Um, you can't, the widow or widower cannot be currently married and they have to be caring for a surviving child who is under the age of 16 or a disabled adult child. Um, there's no getting around this rule. So um, once your child turns 16, you will no longer be entitled to mother's or father's benefits. The child will continue to get benefits for themselves until they turn 18 or 19 um, if they're in school. The benefit is 75% of the worker's primary insurance amount. And remember, if you are caring for a disabled adult child, you would be entitled to mother's or father's benefits um, as long as you don't qualify under, for, under a different category, like you're now age 66 and ready to receive retirement benefits. Um, I think I actually went over this information, um, but these are surviving children. Again, unmarried, under age 18, or a disabled adult child under age 18. The deceased worker must have been insured fully or currently that changes based on age. The benefit amount is 75% of the deceased worker's uh, benefit subject to a family maximum. If there's more than one child, they, the benefit is shared equally amongst all of the eligible children. And it may include children who have not received child support from the deceased worker, as long as they are on um, the birth certificate. It gets a little bit complicated if uh, a father is not listed. We always know who the mother is, as, you know, to the, for the most part. Um, but the father is not always listed on uh, the birth certificate. It could be children from a different marriage or from a relationship outside of the marriage. I've had it happen where a there have been children that the current spouse did not know about and they have lost income to their family because of it. Dependent parents. This is a parent of the deceased worker who died fully insured. The parent has to be at least age 62, did not marry after the worker's death, with certain exception if the um, new spouse um, is entitled to benefits on their own record or is a widow, widower. Um, they're a disabled adult child, they're a divorced spouse, they're, you know, there are just different ways. You have to prove that you were, that you, your child was 
providing one half of your support, similar to the grandparent rule. And you have to provide that proof of support within two years of the worker's death or the worker's application for disability benefits if they had a period of disability prior to receiving retirement benefits. You don't, we often don't think about this category of individuals because most of us are not providing financial support to our older parents, but there are exceptions and uh, so this might be a source of income um, for a family that you don't think about. Lump sum death benefit is only $255. It has remained unchanged for decades. It's a one-time payment and it is only paid to the surviving spouse or children. We have seen cases where family members, unfortunately, fight over this $255, um, but it is there and can help with the funeral expenses. I put this slide in, and this is the effect of early or delayed retirement on a person's benefit amount. Um, this is true for effective 2023. I did not include the year of birth prior to 1941. Uh, if you want information on individuals who were born prior to 1941, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, but as you can see, the benefit amount is reduced quite significantly if you take retirement at age 60. This does not uh, take in, this is not for widows and widowers applying at age 60, but you can see that taking early retirement results in a, you know, 30% reduction of your retirement benefits if you take at age 62. And then you see the gradual um, reduction until age 67. Uh, and if you go in between months, it does go by month, um, but this is just done in general by year. The enhanced retirement benefit uh, for right now for individuals who are not quite 70, if you wait, you and you were born between 1943 and 1954, your benefit will be 32% higher than if you took it at age 66, which would have been your full retirement age. So reduction for early retirement is about 30%. If you wait until age 70, you're going to receive 132% of your benefit amount. The last thing I wanted to talk about today and grandparents and parents alike want to be able to help their children who have a disability and in the past, mostly we were limited to a couple of different mechanisms. One was to set up a special needs um, trust account with a uh, trustee who would grant um, a beneficiary 
been, you know, money for allowed expenses. Um, it required usually the beneficiary to jump through a, quite a few ho hoops. It was expensive to, to set up. Um, and it had a provision, it had to have a provision that required Medicaid to be repaid for any um, services that um, were provided, I think it's after age 60. I, and this is not a comprehensive review of ABLE accounts. They are still very new. They are underutilized um, still because they are so new. They're not even 10 years old yet. They are more similar to um, a 529 savings account or a 401k. They can be worked together with a special needs trust um, to provide income for a disabled child or adult. In South Carolina, it is called the Palmetto Able Savings Program. I provided the phone number and the website. You have to have been a resident, uh, you must be for to use the South Carolina ABLE account. You have to be a South Carolina resident whose disability began prior to age 26. You have to have been disabled for at least a year, or you expect to be disabled for a year. You have to receive either SSI or SSDI on the basis of disability have a condition listed um, on SSA's list of compassionate allowance conditions uh, that there aren't enough for me to, there are so many, I can't go over them, but they're also not enough. They have to, for me to discuss at length, because if, if you have one, Social Security is going to recognize it and approve you for disability. Or you have to self-certify that you have a medical diagnosis from a licensed physician or mental health provider that causes marked and severe functional limitations. Um, on January 1st, 2026, the age of disability will increase from age 26 to age 46. It allows an individual to have more than $2,000 in resources without losing needs-based benefits like food stamps, Medicaid, and even SSI. You can save and invest up to $17,000 a year. That's in 2023, it goes up every year. Um, the funds can be used for education, housing, transportation, healthcare, basically living expenses, including rent. Special needs trust funds cannot be used to pay for rent. That's why ABLE accounts are an improvement over the special needs trust. The funds are not subject to federal or state income taxes if used for approved expenses. You can also take up to 100% of contributions um, that you make off of your South Carolina income tax return up to a maximum of $501,000, which is the maximum lifetime contribution limit. The distributions from an ABLE account are for any qualified disability expenses. In general, it's just supposed to be something that's going to maintain or improve your health or quality of life. 
and it's not supposed to be limited to medically necessary expenses or even expenses that provide no benefit to others. Special needs trusts have those restrictions. So you need money to fix up your house and it's going to benefit other people in the home. That's okay. It's not supposed to be a disqualifier. So it is a really good tool for parents and grandparents to use and that's why I'm trying to uh, what am I I'm trying to make sure that more people know about these accounts as a tool to protect money and to protect your benefits. Medicaid is a very important benefit and often people lose it when they save up money, say, to buy a house, to go to college. And this, these accounts are, are just better. They're easier to set up with the state and they're easier to access when you need income. This roadmap is just a, a simple summary of ABLE accounts, how to enroll, and how to manage the account. Um, this is from the national organization that monitors ABLE accounts and the law. And again, in South Carolina, it is the Palmetto ABLE accounts. And in closing, South Carolina legal services can be contacted with our, through our intake line. Um, the specialists are, are on duty from Monday through Thursday. It's a very busy telephone line. Um, they are open from 9 to 6. I would encourage you to apply online um, if you just don't have the time to st stay on the phone. And these are additional resources uh, that you can access for information on a variety of legal issues, including Social Security, food stamps, now known as SNAP, uh, Medicaid, evictions, probate, family law, consumer issues. Um, that's about all I can think of right now. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. Yeah, I'm that's finished. great um, uh, to um, provide all that information. So if people want to um, contact us and apply for our services, um, if you're eligible, the services are free. Um, so we definitely encourage you to, um, to <clears throat> either go by telephone or online. And um, either way is fine. And you know, for some folks, you can't can't um, get on the telephone um, Monday through Thursday from nine to six, and so that online option is, uh, I think, really helpful. Well, uh, Jenny, thank you so much. This was a terrific presentation, very detailed, and all of those little, you know, amounts and numbers that we all want to know. And, you know, as you said, there is um, quite a bit of misinformation out there. I think um, probably way too many people are um, looking on the internet and uh, getting some wrong information. So I'm glad you were able to uh, provide this today. We really do um, thank you for the time that you put into it and your time uh, being here on Level Up Law. And, and also I wanna thank our audience. Um, we always appreciate uh, folks tuning in live, but if you're on the replay 
um, we appreciate that as well. Um, we hope the information is helpful to you. Um, as I mentioned, we will post a recording of today's episode on our YouTube channel. Just look for that Level Up Law playlist on YouTube at SC Legal Services. Uh, now, when you go to the YouTube page, I always want to um, remind everybody to check that subscribe button if you haven't already. Um, you can go ahead and do that right now if you're uh, watching on the replay. Um, you can uh, help us uh, increase those subscribers and get this information that we share out to more and more people. Um, and if you sign up for the notifications, you'll know every time we post a new video, whether it's Level Up Law or any of our other video resources um, that we provide here at South Carolina Legal Services. And for this particular episode, please do share the video. I'm sure you found it helpful and it might be helpful to someone else that you know. So please definitely um, share that. Um, also, be sure to check our social, other social media, getting all that up-to-date information that we provide on Level Up Law and um, um, in other ways. Uh, we do want as many people as possible to get the important information that we put out there all the time, very regularly. Um, they may not need it, but they probably know someone who does. So thanks again, uh, Jenny Kaufman. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to provide this information. Um, I don't think we have any questions, but I'm just going to double check. No, nope, it looks like there's no questions. You covered it all. <laughs> and, uh, and thanks very much for doing that. Uh, and everyone, be sure to tune in next week on Tuesday at noon for another live episode of Level Up Law. Thanks again, Jenny, producer Kenneth, as well as our viewers, both live and on the replay. That concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you. Have a great week.